So yeah, Steve Hawk, how you doing, man? Outstanding. I'm so. <laughs> are we on the air? Yeah, yeah, we're. Oh, <laughs> this wonderful. is it. This is the podcast. Um, I can't say never better, but um, uh, I would say that um, these are the good old days. Sure. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'm so thrilled to be here. Thanks yeah, for man. inviting me, Steve. You gotta, you gotta live every day and, and get as much as you can out of it. Yeah. I'm down with that. I often think about that. Yeah, when when I watch like people age and stuff, my kids especially. Yeah, I'll see them. And uh, it's like, you think like, oh man, only only three years ago, <laughs> it was so different. Yeah, gotta appreciate every every minute of life. Every phase. Yeah, man. <laughs> so um, so yeah, you were asking me earlier, so yeah, what, what are we gonna talk about? Um, basically, yeah, start with you maybe. Like, you're, I'll give you everyone a little background. So you're, you're uh, a local drummer. Uh, would you, yeah, what do you say, percussionist, drummer? How do you usually? Put yourself, um, and then educator as well. Um, not a snob, so I'm. Uh, someone calls me a drummer. I'm. I take that as a compliment. Nice. <laughs> I remember when um, his name is um, not Nat Cole, Freddie Cole. Freddie Cole. I, I was back in Freddie Cole with Tom Tallman's uh, Art Center band. It okay. Was, it was like a pro resident band based at College of DuPage. Nice. And he, Freddie, couldn't remember any of his name. It's Nat Cole's brother. Right? Okay. Um, and what what year is this? Uh, it might have been 10 years ago. And we're backing him, and he couldn't remember anyone's name. And he said, hey, drums. And I'm like, drums. that's, that's <laughs> nice. me. I like you know, it. if he had a note for me or something, you know, and that was a compliment. So I don't care what anybody calls me. Um, <laughs> sure. You know, I, 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 mean, I really have no excuses. I'm actually formally trained in concert percussion yeah, and timpani. Uh, what and got you into college. music? Tell me a little about your family and, like, uh, what kind of... Uh, you know, like, do you have a musical family? Was your was your dad or mom? Do they play any instruments? Well, I mean, I'll I'll date myself. Um, in the '60s, I mean, I was born in '63, and growing up in um, Deerfield, then Evanston, there were very artsy communities. And okay, you know, my mom was into visual arts like macrame and and painting, and she played some piano and 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 guitar. My hmm. sister played guitar. And um, it was, I was supposed to play something different, and I, I gravitated toward the drums. Um, sure. They bought me a pair of sticks. I beat up an old phone book. Um, <laughs> house calls, lessons were coming over to the house. And, and this, this is just something that stuck with me. Yeah. And um, I've, I've, um, I've always done it. What about uh, first, maybe first snare drum, first drum set? Right. Um, well, before that, they I graduated to a Remo disc practice pad, you know, that looks like a drum head. I broke it once, sure. but replaced it. I still have that thing. <laughs> right. So, you know, this is like when I was six years old or something. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> and then from there, I had a WFL three-piece okay. in the basement. and Was that like a Duco, maybe? No, it was a Silver Sparkle. Oh. <laughs> so, it was a very cool set. And then My, maybe uh, the like a uh, 24. Uh, 22 or probably like 2010 was a center lug yeah, um, what, what size no it was be? it was double lug it would have been 2213 in a matching five okay i see and the my first drum lesson nice. on it was the teacher taught me how to play each different sound so i went um pop psh, boom ba ba boom Boom. Who was Boom. your first teacher? Um, I don't remember his name. It was just some guy who would do house calls to us. And, they and you, you started age maybe, uh, do, do you remember like what year you started taking Yeah, I was like them? six or seven. Oh, you're younger than me. I didn't start till I was like 11 or 12, yeah. That's okay. <laughs> nice. I started piano earlier, <laughs> but yeah, drums not till, not till a little later. Cool, man. I didn't know you started so young. That's awesome. And then uh, what, what, what made you, I mean, you, you got a degree eventually. Yeah, yeah. I'm, so I you mean, did like I said, I have no excuses. I'm college trained and everything. Um, yeah. I went to a bunch of schools, but from there, um, you know, I was practicing and doing drum lessons. At some point, my mom was taking me to Frank's Drum Shop. I was studying with a guy named Leonard. Yeah. Um, and uh, I worked out of Stick Control. Who knows? He might be listening. <laughs> the Drummer's possible. Cookbook is another like funky rhythms and things like that. Drummer's Cookbook. Yeah. You know, who wrote that one. I've heard um, of it. I don't think I've ever used that. I don't though. remember, but it really got a lot of rock and, and funk independence together, oh, and that's nice. what I gravitated towards. You know, pop music and rock. Okay. And from there, um, playing in junior high, we formed bands, and you know, with my mates, we would you know, guitar, bass, <clears throat> drum bands. Sure. Um, we did that through high school as well. 
Um, and then it was, uh, I decided to go off to college and study, be a music major. And, and which college did you go to? Well, I went to Southern Illinois for a year. Okay. And it was a great experience for me as a freshman. I mean, not, I'm not bragging or anything, but I made the top jazz band there and I, that was nice. a great experience. Um, I just felt like, um, I needed more. So after doing a year there, I was de bound and determined I went to Berkeley Music College in Boston. Berkeley, nice. Yeah, which was, um, I was there 82 to 85, and yeah. I actually graduated from there. A lot of students who go there st at that time were going for a semester, and then they'd hit the road with the band or something. They'd meet people there. Sure, sure. I had one roommate who went there. He was the music director in the Toulouse big band and a piano player and a brilliant musician, Toulouse, right. France. And he went there and for part of a semester and said, I miss my family. I've got a full-time music gig back at home in France. Uh, after spending a couple of months, he just went to the bookstore and bought everything he thought that was relevant and checked out. Nice. So a lot of students did that in that era, but I actually stayed the course. And although Berkeley yeah. was accepting just about anybody at the time, you know, a GED equivalent. I heard sometimes there's like maybe too many guitar players. I'm going to move the mic a little closer. Oh, yeah. There's, there's always a lot more guitar players than anything. Right. When I was there, there was only maybe 400 drummers. I think there's about 1,200 now. The school is 400. Expanded. Jeez, yeah, that's a big program. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, some, some people have, like, the best things to say. I, I wonder, uh, yeah, the, so in the, in the 80s you were there. Interesting. Yeah, I, so many people that I've run into, you know, in, in, the, in the music jazz field that end up at that university or college, I guess, in, in, at some point or another. Yeah, it's yeah, easy the, to get into, <laughs> but to actually graduate, you had to take a ton of courses. You had to go through all four levels What's of What's the difference between training? a university and a college? <laughs> um, I, I don't I think it might have to do with, I think, with funding and state affiliation. Like historically, but not really sure. universities were like outside the city, I think. That was a thing. But that's not a thing anymore because I went to Roosevelt University, which is right in the city. <laughs> yeah, not sure if it has to do with private or state funded or I'm not right. sure. <laughs> so, yeah, a yeah. place to get away from the day-to-day -day bustle and to, to focus on maybe arts or sciences yeah <laughs> well yeah, berkeley man. was an amazing place i had a great experience the practice there. room like situation you know you get, it's like, funny you should ask shedding <laughs> uh, it's funny you should ask it was actually very awkward to be a drum set practice person there um, really yeah because you they would give you a locker okay and you would keep your gear in there and then if you're playing in ensembles which everybody did you would have to bring your drum set and set it up for the ensemble rehearsals sure <laughs> and then and then to uh to practice you'd have to set them up into a little cubicle like so they didn't have a room that had a kit in it you had to bring your own not for thing? drum set hmm. no like if you, and i actually did concert percussion and timpani studies there there was an amazing teacher named dean anderson who i studied <laughs> with yeah. and um and there once he gets to know you, he gives you the keys to the, all the his offices and studios, and you have all the instruments there to set up. But for drum set, it was kind of awkward. It was a lot of work. I mean, you can imagine every time you want to play and <laughs> practice, you have to go into a little practice booth sure. and set up your stuff. And my, then, my thing was we had rooms, and there was a kit in there, and you, you could go and practice, but it was always like the tuning of the drums. And so if you wanted to maybe tune them your way, you could, but then someone might leave a note on there later, <laughs> I would say. Oh, it was a shared say, set. It was a shared yeah, set. And then, and what school was that, Steve? Roosevelt, yeah, I went to oh, Roosevelt that's what University. You said. Okay. And uh, it, was, it was fantastic. I mean, Paul, Paul Wertico, he was, he was my teacher. Great. And then um, we had uh, a really, really excellent program. Uh, so yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was a good, a good thing. Practicing is really important. I did at one point because Roosevelt, you did classical and jazz. Did you do a lot of like percussion ensemble stuff? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, that's what I did. I did tons. At one time, I think I was in like twelve different ensembles for a semester, so I was always playing. Just and what you know, it'd be Latin jazz, Latin music ensemble, and then you know, Afro-Cuban ensemble, and then vocal jazz and then <laughs> I was doing which, so which much. I think is the right thing to do yeah if, if you're an instrumental music major you know you perform as much as you can yeah get that experience <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was it was it was so great and they, they had we had a practice room I, I have to talk about this because this is really cool it was one summer I stayed it, it was in the loop in downtown Chicago I stayed in the dorm and in in the auditorium building 
there's uh, the tower of the building, and that's where the jazz department used to be. We got kicked out of there, but at the Chicago College of Performing Arts at Roosevelt University. And I had this room completely to myself the whole summer, and I just practiced in there probably like six hours, seven hours a day, maybe even more <laughs> for the whole summer. Yeah, it was, it was great. Did you, so when you were living out there, did you like stay over the summers? Were you there like permanently or did you come you back? You know, I started out in the dorms. This is in Boston. In Boston, yeah. And then <clears throat> from there, I did that for a year. And then from there, I went home for the summer. Then I ended up renting a studio apartment. Okay, yeah. On Park <laughs> Avenue in the fence. Yeah. Right near the ballpark. But let me, let me mention one more thing about the practice situation there. Sure. Okay, so in that place <laughs> this where is the lock, Berkeley. Yeah. This is at Berkeley. Where there's the lockers and the, and the actual booths, there's, there would be a row of drummers. There might be 30 or 50 drummers just sitting right there. <laughs> and they're all hitting their pad or they're just hitting the carpeted area. And, sure. And they're sitting there and they're doing this. And it was, we just called it drummer's row. That's kind of cool. And it it was cool. So everyone's talking you, about their new rudiment that they're mastering. It yeah, they're 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 sharing chops. You know, How about they're this, working uh, on their technique. Tell, tell me a cool rudiment, a rudiment you like that. Uh, <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm pretty basic. I just go through the nard sure. uh, rudiments. So, Tri- triple Radimacu. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what I was thought was really. Yep, you got it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I learned that when I was really like, young. That was one of the first ones I learned. I was like, oh, I can do that. It was because it's. Three roughs and then like a triplet, I guess. Yeah. Oh yeah, you got to know those. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, it's real easy to get uh, sidetracked. But back to this drummer's row. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. We're but just having they, fun. They, yeah. um, a lot of them were gearheads. They love talking about gear, and I was like, sure. like dudes, you're spending all day here talking about gear. You realize you're at Berkeley <laughs> College, and so I made up my mind not to be a gearhead. Sure. At that time. And so it was very simple. I had my, I, I bought a Ludwig set, like a Keystone set, as my school set. And then back at home, I had this Premier kit, which was very much like a Keith Moon kit. Because nice. in high school, I was, I yep. was, it was a huge influence on Premier me. makes great drums. So I had yeah, those yeah. two kits, and I said, that's, that's it, I'm done. Hmm. And then what happened is, when I started, as, as I started playing different music, you know, like if I wanted to sound like Art Blakey, how can I sound like that? Sure, or, sure. or Max Roach or Kenny Clark, what were they playing at the time? So I was like, well, I'm gonna have to get a round badge Gretsch set. And so I started dabbling in the instruments of whatever I was studying. And then if you go back even further, hmm. when the bass drums got even bigger and you know, the old Ludwigs, the leading Ludwig is uh, the yeah, drum yeah. set that I love playing. And, um, yeah, you've to, got really cool leady stuff. I'm a big leady fan. I like a lot of the leady stuff. But yeah, to get those sounds, then it's you want to have the right instrument, the right tool for the job. And so am I gearhead now? Um, I don't know if that's the case, but um, I need more than those two sets. So <laughs> I would I say you're, you're, gear, you're gear interested. Yeah, <laughs> you're, not, you're not obsessed with gear, but you're definitely, you, you know what, what you're looking for and, and you use stuff. Yeah. So for everyone listening, um, the, the, I don't remember exactly when I met you, but the, the reason, yeah, that, that I know you probably, we probably met at the shop. Maybe did we meet downtown at one point? I'm not sure. It might've been, what year would in, that be? Um, it might've been when, uh, Steve Maxwell drums were in Naperville. Yeah. Probably in Naperville. So and I you, knew your dad downtown. You play, you play a, a lot of big band stuff all around kind of Chicago land. What, what are the, what are the groups you're playing with now? Um, um, let's see. Tomorrow night I'm with uh, the swing band, uh, the resident swing band at the Green Mill Lounge. Nice. This is a shout out. So for anyone listening, come come check out these. Some, some of these are weekly too. So yeah, yeah, this, this will probably a, go up in about two weeks, but yeah. <laughs> oh, but yeah, the band is there every Thursday. Yeah. Um, um, it's led by Alan Gresick, who's been there for probably 25 years. And he, he's a specialist in 30s and 40s swing dance yeah. music. So um, if you get on the website for the Green Mill, and if you're not from, from Chicago, it's probably like one of my favorite music rooms. Yeah, it's there's, really great. There's music there every Very night. Very historical. Yeah, it's if, been there before forever. Before the pandemic, there were, there were two acts. There'd be like an 8 to 12 and a 12.30 to 4. Yeah. Um, pretty late. So, um, <laughs> so, but if you get on their website, they bill Tuesday nights and Thursday nights as dance nights. And the rest are are more listening jazz nights. And this would be this is kind of trad jazz stuff. That's what we call it. Or what, yeah, is that the 
the correct terminology? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm the, you can call it whatever you want, but sure. uh, but if <clears throat> the terms that I like to throw out there Dixieland. is swing, yeah. swing, it's, yeah. it's the swing era music from the, like the mid mid thirties, mid to late thirties into like 40, 1945. So that would be the swing era, right? And so that's what this band focuses on. Yes, yeah. um, so that's so your Thursday thing, and then you you do some more like. Uh, uh, real big band because that's not a big band that's maybe what like six well pieces, it, seven it was big band of the time it was it's it's 11 so oh 11 um, p this, i didn't know that it fit all in there in this Jeez, era, wow. like if you look at early benny goodman early sure. Artie shaw orchestras uh-huh. they're not big band like um they were in the in the mid late 40s so the front line would be four saxes yeah, yeah. you know um two alto two tenor the second line would be two trombones the third line would be three trumpets, and then piano, bass, drums, guitar, nice rhythm. So um, I counted it once; it was eleven. So, and then, but then there's singers and the it, radio show hosts too. People that just you know do period correct ads. Sometimes they just ad lib ads. Uh, uh, sure. One guy is really good at doing that. Um, they have scripted ads. They do them on the fly, and it's kind of a, a mock radio show. Oh, so they actually. They do them there. Oh, it's, it's like you're listening to old time radio. That's oh yeah, they have the really ads cool. and the announcements. And they do it live. They, they oh, it's that's. yeah, it's like a live show. And I've been it, for years, I'm going to go go to these one of these. I, I will make it out there. So every Thursday, you're there. Every Thursday, the band's been there forever. And the other dance night at that club is Tuesdays. It's a group led by Andy Shum. Used to nice. be the Fat Babies, and now he calls his group the <laughs> the Cellar Boys. Andy Shum and the Cellar Boys. So, and, but that's a different era, though, and a genre. That's more sure. 20s hot, like Louis Armstrong, Big Spider back. So kind more of New Orleans style, maybe a little more? Although um, he was like up in Chicago. Hot, but, hot yeah. band, yeah. I mean, he, he, I mean, <laughs> he originally uh, came from New Orleans, though, I think, right? Well, if, um, um, what's, the, what's the trumpet player? King Oliver, they, they started in New Orleans, of course. And then they went in uh, 1911, Storyville was shut down by the Naval department that was the that was the place where all the music was and um so oh, they shut down because it, it was it shut was down because of vice and kind of similar to Bravos. maxwell street in chicago probably they, they um i think it was shut down for the same oh, reason why it, there the was prohibition was, it was just oh, was so much earlier, so yeah. much vice you know there's a lot of brothels there and sure and i think um people lobbied to get it shut down and the navy shut it down in 1911 and all these mm-hmm. musicians migrated to different cities and Chicago being one of them. And King Oliver came to Chicago and then he invited Louis as a sideman playing second trumpet with him. So that's the, that's the style. It's, um, I wouldn't wait. I don't, what would you call it? Dixieland? Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm no people, expert people in everything. Listening, some people listening probably really don't have never listened to early jazz. And then some people listening might be really experts on it. So yeah, you know, what what's the, the kind of most broad term that even though it may not be a perfect term, it, it really represents for, the for style. For the 20s, <laughs> I would think hot jazz for most people. would be it. Hot jazz. Hot nice. jazz. <laughs> and the dance styles was, um, it was the Charleston. Yeah, so, so which, which is ba, 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 ba. But, yeah. yeah, and you know a lot of upbeat. The drummer was using the um, contraptions, you know, bass drum, snare drum, wood the traps. Blocks. Yeah, the traps. And this, and, this is um, the genesis the cymbals of the drum were small, and they were, and they right. were they would ride on the cymbal with one hand choking it, and manipulating it that way. No hi hat. It was like that going on, and then silent films, and like both of those seems to have built this this uh, drum set that we all play now. Yeah, so. So yeah, that, that's that's really cool. Now uh, you you're gonna do some playing later. That'll be at the end of this. So for everyone listening, if you want to hear some of these really early jazz feels, which are very different than what you might expect, because you didn't really go on the ride cymbal. Actually, a lot of them they didn't have a ride cymbal. They'd have a china cymbal or maybe even like a splash. They would a lot. It's very snare drum oriented, and and then they wouldn't even have a hi hat. Actually, when was the hi hat invented? That that'd be like. 20s right? well i'm thinking joe jones okay with count basie like papa joe yeah. um yeah papa joe jones um <clears throat> he and i and chick webb was playing some hi-hat too in the early yeah, like 30s. a low boy at that point maybe um and and so um that definitely changed the style because when you're playing on that instrument but um to me this is something that i feel 
um, it's important for you know people who are studying this instrument, which we all are, all the drummers are. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's a an lost important thing part in, of the in, lineage that you school, have to understand. I, interesting, yeah. In school, did did it seems to me like that's one of those periods where it's like, oh well, that happened, and then let's move on to this. Maybe not a lot of people actually spend like time like really trying to get that feel to, to sound right well i can just tell you about my school experience you know when yeah, i was yeah. at when i was at berkeley boston i mean anything prior to you know 40s miles davis charlie parker bebop was square you know it just didn't sure. there wasn't a lot of interest in there i don't even know if the faculty have any interest or experience with it so sure. i didn't get any any um early traditional hot or swing training at all in the schools. Right. So um, I don't know if that's the case now. Uh, David Berger is a guy who does a lot of old Duke Ellington transcriptions, and you're seeing that in some of the high school band <laughs> literature now, and in, in even some of the local I, bands I'm seeing it. I was listening to a, a guy. It was like Drummer World podcast. It was one of the other podcasts about drums, and he was. they were watching uh, Buddy Rich play, <clears throat> and... They were just talking about where does his feel come from, like what what is he playing, what is he doing, and you know, regardless of what your feelings on Buddy Rich are or swing or all that kind of stuff, it's interesting because yeah, the, those like swing drummers from that era, Buddy Rich, he grew up and and Gene Krupa, they were like when they were really young, this stuff that we're talking about here, that's what was kind of the the core to their feel, and. And it's a real driving thing. Maybe like I'm thinking like an up tempo, you know. Um, and it's it swings so hard. <clears throat> it's but the feel is it's it's not necessarily like we do now on the ride cymbal. Really, it's it's a little more of. A, I mean, yeah. What what do you think? Well, yeah, I have some opinions Any ideas about on that? that. And yeah, um, yeah. I'm curious because um, I have opinions, but, but I'm always and, you and know, they're and they're uh, <laughs> it's here, stuff so. that I haven't always had. You sure, know? And, and that's because if I mean my. My training was, you know, I mean, my influences. I'm listening to classic rock, hard rock mm -hmm. as a kid, playing that kind of music, then going, um, studying some bebop, and then from there, going backwards. It's chronological, like my, my influences and in training has been chronolo chronologically backwards. Right, right. And that's why I think it's so important for drummers to, I mean, it's so beneficial for me playing in this band every Thursday that is doing Artie Shaw transcriptions, Benny Goodman, yeah. early Duke Ellington, early Count Basie, and, um, and listening to this music all the time. And so it's, to me, it's a combination of two things. It's getting the drum vocabulary together. Like how did, how did the drummer play the beat? Mm -hmm. What were the influences? Or uh, like what were the different sounds? And, um, and the other thing is once you have the vocabulary, you have to apply it to the literature, the repertoire. Sure. So for me, um, I, I thought, oh, I've got the vocabulary together for early swing when I didn't, you know, and it, well, only by playing it for a few years, a lot of years, do, do I feel like I'm getting the combination of the, the, voca the vocabulary, the, the language combined with the literature, the repertoire. Sure. <laughs> and for me, the new frontier is I'm at the same place now with the 20s hot jazz, where I feel like, okay, I've got the vocabulary, you know, I've got splash symbols i can play the the beat on the snare yeah, drum. what's your setup for thursdays what's your like exact setup um that is very much like a, a buddy rich <laughs> or, or gene krupa set oh, okay cool yeah, very much okay, like that. it's a secret you have to come see me <laughs> <laughs> oh not not at all um but well like if but if you're trying to play 20s authentically so you got a and, big bass drum probably 20 uh, uh the 24. one i i like to use the 24 the, yeah, the which is actually like, small for back then but yeah so but <clears> if you're doing like hot jazz from the 20s you know i mean if if you go out playing that style of music you don't bring a hi-hat and if you are if you have a hi-hat and you're playing other styles at the same event i have to take my foot off the hi-hat pedal because otherwise sure. the temptation is too great out of habits and um and there you you know you play the beat on the snare drum you play it, it on the blocks i think there's a you miles davis symbol quote like i can't i can't stop uh playing all these notes take the horn out of your mouth <laughs> and that's so if you're a drummer yeah and if you're trying to like learn uh um you know i, I want to play more on the ride and take so just maybe just take your left hand and sit on it and then if you want if you're comping too much or if you're doing too much hi-hat 
shenanigans. Yeah, you gotta just take your foot off the pedal. <laughs> yeah, man. The that's uh, that's a, is that a correct quote from Miles? Um, I haven't heard it, but I like it. He was saying, yeah, who knows? I heard that uh, maybe at a at a show or something like that. I think it was a Miles Davis thing. I could imagine him saying that. So like, so I mean, <clears throat> for my, I can just say from my experience, it was it was chronologically backwards, sure. and then by by um, experimenting with twenties jazz, it can I, I can it's easier for me to understand the lineage going forward. Right. The other thing that I learned is um um. It's one thing to play it at home, but playing it in a band in a room where maybe people are eating dinner mm-hmm. or it, it might be a, a cocktail set sure, up front sure. or playing a supper club where you have to develop a certain touch on the instrument that you might not get just oh, playing yeah. along with videos or at home. I think also practice pads can be dangerous because just playing on a real drum, it's so much more... Like here, here's an. You're used to hitting the pads so hard. Oh, I hear you. And then yeah. you, it's very difficult to pull back after. I hear you. Um, <laughs> so like, here's just an example. Like, um, we're playing um, an Artie Shaw or Benny Goodman feature that mm-hmm. features clarinet solos a lot. Um, back in the day, they didn't uh, rely on electronics. A lot of it was done acoustically. And if you listen to the arrangements, they they become somewhat formulatic, not in a bad way, but they're, if they, you know, loud introduction. Loud instrumental. There are then rules in the music. When yeah, somebody, really when somebody was hits. started yeah. singing, you know, you go to the brushes or you play very softly. Yeah. And then when <laughs> there's a interlude that's maybe a two D section or a shout chorus in the, in the arrangement, then you're picking up the sticks. Sure. So it's very formulatic, and it's so important that you're playing with a group that's on board and and, and like everybody's com- agreeing with compared that. Compared to like like modern rock drumming, even on the loud parts, you're probably holding back a little bit i imagine right um i don't understand say that again like compared to modern playing rock you know so you're playing like with a amplified guitar and bass uh you're probably still holding back a little bit even during the loud portions of the, during the vocal you mean uh even during the loud portions of the tune what do you think do, do you do you like volume wise how high do you get when you when you play this stuff well i mean that that's with like a, a nine piece band that's another discussion there because even like we're talking about playing soft for the singer or when the clarinet is soloing, sometimes I'm not splashing out on the hi-hat to play sure. time. I might just be playing on the snare drum, you know, in, in soft chip on two and four and feathering the bass drum. Right. It could be like like little roughs and little drags on the snare drum and little yeah. embellishments. And, you what know, I'm trying to express is, yeah, all the stuff that you're playing is probably on the light volume side. <laughs> Having a light touch is very... Because, yeah, feathering the bass drum, you... You barely even just. Well, it's I. I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily kind of say light all the time. It's definitely on the acoustic music side, sure. where you're not. You're playing a stage volume, and you're not relying on, you know, um, the sound guy. <laughs> yeah, the sound guy and stadium type yeah. of enforcement. But having said that, um, I I played a room that everybody, all the musicians in town want to play now. It's called the Epiphany Center. The Epiphany Center. Yeah, is it's it in a, Chicago? Yeah, or? yeah, it's a room that everybody wants to play. Heard and of it? Never been there. Uh, it was the Outcast big Outcast jazz band. We were there just last Sunday. We do a one a month dance party there. Where is it a new joint or is it? It's pretty new. I would say they just opened up within the last year. Oh, but cool. it's uh, it's an old church that has been redone into this arts mecca where huh. they have. Um, art galleries and there's two music rooms like the huge sanctuary that must um, be it's pretty uh, it's huge. sonically uh remarkable <laughs> yeah the the way the well that reverb in there <laughs> yeah yeah it's a challenge to play the room sure um there's also a small room upstairs where they do like more intimate things nice, but um, nice. playing playing the big room it's like for me the as a as a drummer you it's a challenge because you have to have your uh, an incredible dynamic range i feel to play that band's music in sure. that venue. So yeah, you have to play soft for like accompanying the vocals. Um, and then, and, and the clarinet solos and, and, and for that as well. This band doesn't focus as much on 30s and 40s. It's more of a, a Rat Pack um, hmm. kind of a, a Yeah, wh- a group. when exactly did they move to like the, because the, the earlier, the early stuff is like kind of a but brr, but brr, but like on the snare drum like one two when did they move to 
Ding, ding, da, ding, ding. Is, I think is there the like hi-hat, a year that happened? <laughs> in my opinion, the hi hat came in be- be- between that. Okay, so so first you have but and kind of feather in the bass drum on four on the floor, and then you have the hi hat on. They, they were like low boys. They started putting on two and four, maybe. Well, it's just a, oh, you, we don't have a drum set. Well, we okay, will later. We're do that later. So yeah. you're gonna play this later. That's why I'm, you know. So so for those watching, but um, it, yeah, it was that? I, I suppose it wasn't one year. But do do you know of like a drummer maybe or or a band that kind of has the reputation of being one of the first to? I'm to thinking move Joe over? Jones, I and mean, he's the guy really? famous that, for his early hi hat work. Chick Webb did early hi hat oh, work yeah. too. Um, yeah, yeah the, they, they bring out like just the hi-hat. And, and then so um, much there, and yeah. <laughs> there's examples. They're rare, but you hear guys riding out on a, a cymbal. Now, they're not like a 22 yeah, dark yeah. cymbal. They're probably they're, like a 16 they're or hand, something. Yeah. They're old hand cymbals. Constantinople. Sure. They yeah. sound like they're old hand cymbals. They might be 16 or 18s, but there's examples in the late 30s where you hear did, guys riding out on did them. Did you know Barrett Deems? Did you oh, know yeah, him? I met him, yeah. Nice, yeah. He was, I think uh, we were talking about swing and uh, how like, some of the early drummers that just have like such a driving swing feel that's just unbelievable. How like, at least I was trying to talk about how I think that some of that comes from that really early trad da- jazz, Dixieland, hot jazz, whatever you want to call it. They grew up in that environment. And yet, um, Barrett Deems, an example, there's a video of him playing the Chicago Jazz Fest, I think, I can't remember who he's playing with, but just where he puts his rim shots while he's playing you can tell that came from him playing on the snare originally. And it's just where he puts them. It's just, it's, it's just a remarkable thing. I'll show you the video later. Maybe we'll put a link up to it. Yeah, Barrett I mean, Deems in the Barrett 80s. Barrett was a class act. This is in the was, 80s, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, was, he was an amazing guy. My, 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 my Barrett Deems story is... Uh, Everybody met, has one. I met him <laughs> and <met> um, <laughs> I first heard him play at the Alba Room, leading, okay. leading his own big band. Nice. And he was playing super bright peisty cymbals because i think that was what he from his hearing loss i think that's what he was able to hear that was kind of the thing then too i mean louis belson was playing really heavy cymbals I'd say it around was then. in the late 80s when i heard him do that buddy rich was playing heavy cymbals the only big bands that were left everyone was playing heavy cymbals yeah at that point yeah the volumes were getting louder so i i heard him <laughs> play there but i ran into him at mike gassman's percussion shop in evanston and I, you know, I was hitting symbols, always looking for symbols. Mike and he's Gassman's like, "Hey, percussion job. That's that's cool. People listening. I bet you there's at least a couple of people who who like. They're probably not there anymore. He's not there anymore. No. That says. I bet you there are a couple people who know that place. So, um, <laughs> Barrett's there. Hey, kid, what are you doing? What, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm just listening to symbols. Hey, don't buy any of this stuff. Come over to my house. I got a basement full. I'm going to give you a bunch. And to this day, I regret not going over there. I didn't want to take advantage of an old. I man. went to his house, but my dad was good friends with him. Okay. He had like a big long. Chicago play. I think it was a flat, and uh, I, I remember the basement. I remember it being yeah, full of lots of stuff and lots of drums. <laughs> and every he said everything doesn't swing. <laughs> we'd, we'd have the radio on. He's like, "Yeah, sucks. Doesn't swing." <laughs> but he, man, he was right. Like the the that swing thing. Just yeah, like where where there's like a, a one specifically nice placed rim shot on like a nice syncopated and. Of, of some beat will just make something swing so well. You don't have to do like a eight million notes. It's just, and that that's, I think that's from this, this, you know, people who kind of grew up in that, in that, uh, well, yeah, that we're coming back to the lineage <clears throat> yeah, yeah. of, of the history of drumming. And when we study guys like that, you mentioned Louis, I mean, all the older drummers were dance band drummers primarily. Or I mean, even tap dancers themselves. <laughs> uh, Buddy Rich, for sure. Louis, Louis Belson, the first double bass guy that I know of. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, because he can do his dance rhythms with, with two feet. Um, Barrett Deems was from then. Um, Joe Jones. I mean, a lot of the, the, the bands, they were dance bands, and they're also coming from a marching tradition, too. Hmm. So, um, and the other, that's why, you know, the beat had those qualities. It was like, it was like bounce to the step. It's a very, like that early stuff, it had, the drummer really lays down almost like a two feel almost, but there's bounce to it. <laughs> well, the, the other thing, the other theory is, and this is something I've heard recently, is a lot of the, the bands, well, they had, if they either, the early bands from the hot bands were like tuba or string bass. Sure. Or even a bass sax. Right. Maybe euphonium <laughs> in a pinch. Um, I haven't seen them. I haven't seen them, but maybe. Yeah, that's like but a small tuba. But when they were tuba. string bass players, they you know they weren't playing with amps in the twenties and the thirties, and you could barely hear them. And a lot of the players weren't that strong. 
And so the leaders would depend on the the drummer to lay down that four on the floor sure, or sure. on one and three, just to just pr- to provide this dance pulse. Yeah, you're and, the and framework. they're playing in big ballrooms. You're like the framework. Yeah, absolutely. You're the framework. Yeah. But you know, it's this is an eye opener for me or an ear opener when I'm when I'm dabbling in hot music from the 20s. You know, I mean, most of us grew up thinking the music has to be drummer led, right? I mean, you know, we're playing you know, my way or the highway, if we're playing rock, you know, here's the beat, and sure, we're interacting, here's give and take. Drum, drums in front. It's also a recording style, like if you're recording stuff, some engineers will put the drums way up in front, others will be way behind, yeah. Or like playing with a click track, it's just sure. you, you you follow it, right? And that and um, a, lot of, a lot of jazz drumming is like that as well. But the hot bands, to me, was an ear-opener because if you play like that, you're not going to be very popular because a lot of times those bands are melody-led or banjo-led. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, banjo. It's yeah. almost like a classical style where the melody, like all the supporting sections need to uh, support the melody. You, you like, Dynamic-wise, uh, but also time-wise, too. Yeah. But, or with the banjo is so strong. You big Django Reinhardt fan? He's a guitar player, but, right? He yeah. he he's a steady at uh, the other the club we were talking about, Green Mill. Nice, yeah. The, someone who does Django stuff. Uh, who are you talking about? Um. Oh. Okay, oh. Yeah. I'm talking about Django. You're the, talking the about guy the from, real guy. Okay. Yeah. Long. He only had like three fingers. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I think he was. He couldn't really use his pinky. Amazing guitar. But, but that banjo led stuff. If, so you if you if that, you go in there, my way or the dun- highway, playing twenties like that, chunk it's, chunk. you're a not going to be. <laughs> you're not going to be popular. And sure. <laughs> so um, you have to you have to follow the banjo player. And if mm. there's not a banjo player, it might be guitar or even melody. It, you know, you follow the melody. Whoever's lead playing lead at the time. Yeah. So, yeah. And this this was a new concept for me. Yeah, the and the for everyone, we're, it's the chunk of chunk. It's jink, 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 right. jink, 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 just every quarter note in four four, just uh, a nice uh, solid voicing of the chord. <laughs> Actually, I know we're kind of jumping around. Where it sounds That's fine. Random. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds kind of random. <laughs> but oh when, yeah, I like that. I like when that. We're, <laughs> when I find I'm playing this period music, it helps <clears> when you have a group of guys or girls that are with you that are on board. To having like let's just say let's take the um, Gresic band every Thursday at the Green Mill. We have um, a string bass player and a guitar player, and Alan's playing piano. But we strive to have a group sound where not anybody's like standing out. Sure. Um, and if the guitar the, if the guitar player comes in with an instrument that's not the right sound, like um, I'm just gonna say an L5 Gibson with high action or something <laughs> and not relying on the, the amplifier. Like if you go in there with a Strat, it's not going to sound the, sound the right way. They want, you want like a hollow body. It, it, um, it's high action. Palm. It's very <laughs> percussive. Yeah. It, it, and, um, and not relying on the, the electronics. And if, the, if you think about the dynamic range of the guitar. So the original the stuff would have been a totally acoustic guitar. Oh, yeah. And then with a microphone right up to it. Uh, when they even did that, I mean, until they, they started. Well, they the set pickups. up the instruments yeah. so that it, it can project. You know, it's high action, it's thick gauge strings. For so, the do guitar. you do you guys have like a a guy with an actual uh, like acoustic instrument that has a mic on him? <laughs> no. Uh, well, we're kind of a hybrid for that band. Then you get feedback issues. Yeah, it's um, hard to it, do it that it's, way. <laughs> it's somewhat of a hybrid. Um, it's not a hundred percent acoustic because I've sure, heard sure. groups play. <laughs> Try to play 100% acoustic there when the room is filled with people. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's. I mean, every Thursday there, it's like New Year's Eve, 1999. I sure. Mean, <laughs> I mean, it's 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 such a party atmosphere right there. And I've heard bands go in there when the room is filled that way and try to go acoustic. And and to to me, I kind of like. I'm on board with the hybrid acoustic. Yeah, with yeah. Some reinforcement. We have the technology now. They would have used it back then if they had. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but it's never overbearing. It's just enough to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but maybe uh, acoustic for mics. a recording session. That would be cool. Oh, but but, then but even a, live, they have some for assistance. A live but thing, it's yeah. never, <laughs> it's never overbearing. It's nice. like, you know, like if you had to put numbers, it's not eleven or even seven. It's like start at one half and then go, you know, work work with that. It's what's, just a little bit of enforcement. What's some really cool tunes that you guys play that probably no one's ever 
ever heard of that are that are really fun. Um, you're asking the drummer who who, who just plays the beats. Okay, sure. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, we'll do um, a lot of the a lot of the bassy tunes. We'll do um, like the Artie Shaw, um, the Benny Goodman songs. Um, it's just their repertoire. It's it's yeah, because I know there's their hits from that. There's era. kind of a trad jazz real book, <laughs> and then there's like a modern jazz real book, and then. The two, they're both in, you know, there's so many different real books, but I don't know. I was just thinking, I mean, what, let's see, uh, what's a good, a good old, t- old tune from that era that they would have played? Uh, what is it? Um, Louis Armstrong, uh, app, is it Apple, there's an apple in the title. That's a good one. Apple honey, um, um, Hun- honeysuckle rose. Okay. Yeah. Um, that yeah that's an old that's, that's an a good old that's a good yeah sure. that would be something that you guys would maybe play well yeah. a lot of those came from the like the american popular songbook became yeah. jazz standards um throughout um so we're talking um music musical theater a lot tin of pan songs. alley that's what you're talking about it's, it's in new york city where there was this big music row where people would just be composing uh left and right for for all different types of yeah, that's where these tunes a lot of them came from like Maybe like all of me, yeah, <laughs> all these different. Uh, yeah, a lot of them from the musical theater, but yeah, Tin Pan Alley yeah. was an intense place, from what I know about it. What do you know about it? Um, I don't know just, much. <laughs> uh, just that, uh, you know, when, like if you read Irving Berlin's biography, okay, um, he was uh, he was as a kid he would go around. He was the youngest of like many kids. I don't uh, like over ten, over ten kids in his family. He was hmm. the youngest, um, and um, they immigrated from Russia. And him being the youngest, he assimilated better than a lot of his older siblings and his parents. Hmm. Um, and so he was a, a shuckster. A shuckster. <laughs> he would go around. He would go around and sing in clubs for tips. Okay. And so, and he he learned a lot about uh, crafting songs, like what would be popular, what what would be a good song. And um, from there, um, he became uh, he he just he kind of evolved his songwriting skills. To the point where he would he would pitch them in Tin Pan Alley, and then there were pounders. You would go in there with sheet music. First, he didn't know how to write, so he blue had to skies, have... blue skies over me, nothing but blue skies. Do I see? <laughs> that's a good that's Irving an, Berlin tune. That's an important standard. So um, <laughs> you guys ever play that one? Oh. Yeah, it's 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 standard repertoire. That's yeah. a good one to call at any gig, any jazz thing. <laughs> I saw the it, sun yeah. shining so bright. <laughs> that's the first time I've ever sung on a podcast. So <laughs> you bring out the best in me, Steve. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> or maybe the worst. <laughs> but but yeah, man, that's that's awesome. So yeah, tell tell me more about yourself. Um, maybe like we we kind of ended. You know, you did like college and stuff. How, how did you originally get into the this this old school? I mean, you talked about it a little bit, but do you remember like maybe the first? first group you ever play with was it this thing on the thursday i mean how long have you been doing it um i think i've been in the old school stuff the, group. The, yeah I've, I've been in the thursday green meal band for maybe 12 years so. that's a while so so that is that was that like the first that brought you into that that uh that culture well hot jazz culture <laughs> and you know it's you no know, i mean leading up to that i i also play in tom fox's it's a local band called the brass tracks sure and that's every, i sat in for you that's once every wednesday you, yeah, i subbed for you once yeah, you, yeah. you did more twice than actually in. Yeah. you subbed a couple of times yeah <laughs> that was great fun i don't i don't play often with big bands and so reading i have to say anyone who does that on a regular basis my hat is off to them because it's just you got a lot of, you're, you're juggling a lot of things when when you're doing that and you got the whole big band relying on you and it's it's a great thing. There's not a lot of money in it, but it's just it's such beautiful music that needs to be heard. The the big band stuff, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The brass tracks. Where are they playing now? Are they still? Um, they're at the Quarry in Lamont. Okay, and then are you, are you still playing with them? Yeah, that's a Steady Wednesday. So Steady Wednesday. This is another place. Um, the Quarry in Lamont brass tracks band definitely worth <laughs> worth scoping out. Yeah. Um, and if you had to describe that band, it's very similar to um, Buddy Rich's concept, where people are not allowed to dance to his sure. to his shows. His are our jazz concerts. Sure, sure. And that was the concept for um, for Buddy Rich um, when he started his group. Um, yeah, there and, are, they, they and that's kind of the concept of this. It's it's very much it's a jazz gig with a big band. 
Right. So we're playing Bill Holman. We're playing, um, um, a, you know, Buddy Rich arrangements. Um, we're playing uh, tunes that were uh, Gordon Goodwin. They're like listening jazz arrangements. So, and to me, the challenge there, like you're saying, is reading because um, the he just can't keep doing the same tunes every week because the money is so light that people they were great keep coming out. They were great tunes that he called, though. I remember because I've I've sat in with some so, bands where it's like, whoa, man, this thing is. <laughs> Yeah, where are we going next? But the, those well, he'll, were he'll cater the he'll they cater were, the 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 set list to the lineup. This is the thing. Know, yeah, if he's got some subs and key positions, he's not going to be pulling up. The you know, top, the, yeah, the the chick the chick Korea arrangements. What, and what's stuff. the the big uh, Buddy Rich one? It's uh, um, well, a couple in the book is, and I know your dad likes to play them. Is the Buddy Rich uh, the Buddy Rich um, West Side Story West Side Story Suite yeah. and the Channel One? Right, right. That's. And he, he did it from memory. He didn't read music, which is kind of cool, actually. But when I play with big bands, I actually kind of don't really read the music sometimes. I'll try to, but then sometimes you just kind of get lost a little bit. If there's like a coda or something, you might, oh, geez, you know, maybe half the time you're like right and know exactly where you are. But sometimes I just look at the, look at the whole thing, get it, get it going, especially well, if you know the tune, if you know the hits. Well, you know? I'm thinking part of our training is you, <laughs> you have to be so versatile. It's not like being... The, yeah. it, like it, it's really the concept of being a side man sure if you're a side man you have to have the skills to be backing up the artists that you're backing yeah right and it's it's it has to do with serving the music not not presenting your individuality all the time sure sure and to me and, and that goes in line with this big band playing because you know, if you're playing um, listening jazz, you approach it one way. If you're playing dancing big band, it's a different approach. But it, at the beginning, in the middle, and the end of the day, you never want it to sound like you're reading, you know? So when, when you're playing with a big band, let's say this is your attention span, what, do, how would you divide it up if you have like paying attention to the chart, paying attention to the audience, paying attention to maybe the soloist? Maybe those three. Like, how would you? How would you? How would you divide up your? I would your... say never the audience. Never the audience. Okay. Unless, unless it's a dance job and you're playing a certain way. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it, it it goes back to what we're talking about. You uh, you have to have a very wide skill set. Hmm. Very very diverse skill set, so that um, you when the and the, and this is Mel Lewis personified. It, hmm. When it, you're playing shout courses or two D sections. You're giving the 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 other instruments what they need to be successful, sure. And having a dynamic range to do that, whether it's loud or soft, and putting the figures, knowing when to play the figures and when not to, you know, or when to play in between the figures. And this is just the vocabulary that's, that's that what you I need did. to I, get. That's what I said last time. I, if you play, <laughs> I, missed, I if, made a mistake. Oh, I was just playing in between the figures. Hey, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, but don't. if you're, to, I find if you're just playing the figures that are written or that the sure. winds are playing, get that's, a square, there's maybe. a there's a lopsidedness to that ensemble, and yeah. they don't need that. Like listen to, um, <laughs> listen to the. Um, the um what's his name the Count Basie drummers a lot of times ba ba da ba da ba da 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 ba da ba they'll just hit the first note of the figure just for for just yeah. for, uh for impact but they don't always play I mean it's just as long too, as it's, it's too swinging. awkward yeah as long as it's swinging and oh then, yeah the Count Count Basie stuff modern big bands whenever I watch them yeah it's it's so funny because they sometimes jazz will maybe rush a little bit just the swing feel it, it's prone to a little bit of rushing, but then the Count Basie stuff, you really got to hold back in a way that, um, it, it not, yeah, not all like, yeah, the Buddy Rich band probably never did that, <laughs> that, that, that really, um, you know, <clears throat> well, like, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, st I got Paris, you know, like duh, 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 duh. it's really behind the beat. You know what? Um, I, I have a story about that that is kind of relevant, and it was ear-opening for me. When I uh, <laughs> At the Midwest Band Clinic, mm -hmm. they had... Madeline always goes to that. <laughs> oh, does she? Yeah, she's with Chicago Youth Symphony Orchestra. Yeah, that's okay. my wife. <laughs> she's um, in Germany went, right now. I told you earlier. Yeah. That's, that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, she's, um, she's having fun, I think. Yeah, we, just, yeah, we hope she's being safe. <laughs> so I heard a clinic from the rhythm section players of the Count Basie band. 
Okay. So I can't tell you the whole lineup. I know it was. Um, I would pay a lot of money to see that. I think. Um, <laughs> Um, what, what's his name? Um, what year is Grover, this? It was it was the era where Grover Mitchell, the trombone player, was leading it. Butch Miles was the drummer. Okay, yeah. And the bass player, I think, was original, and there was a piano player and a guitar player. And um, they came out and they and they talked about concepts of playing in mm. the big band. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, and for them to do this, they their schedule, they were literally touring fifty weeks a year and then they had a week off they said sure we'll do it <laughs> sure so i mean uh, i appreciated them being there and um uh, a high school band teacher he met well he says can you talk to us about how like the horns rush and the rhythm section you know plays ahead of the beat and then you know all this other stuff and um it was the bass player that looked at him and he just looked looked at him and said i don't know what you're talking about we just go out there and play the music every night next question you know, yeah. it's like, it's just, it's not super analyzed, you know, it's just, um, it's just whatever the music calls for it. Now there, if it, the music doesn't have a forward propulsion to it, mm. then that could be terrible. But just like in classical music too, like I worked with some conductors that said very rarely is the beat not without some sort of concept, whether it has a forward pro propulsion or if it's laying back. So it's just whatever the music's calling for. And yeah. so I think it's a We're dangerous... We're not robots. We're not robots. Yeah, We're... I think it's a dangerous place to say, <laughs> oh, well, the, the horns have to stay ahead of the beat. But I will say this, though. When you're playing um, an individual, like I, the saxophones, I don't need to pick on the saxophones, but when you're playing in the swing band, the Thursday night band, um, a lot of these young hotshot players, they're like right out of college. Sometimes they're still in college. They come in there with these, <laughs> with these expansive, swingy beats and things but when they're when they need to be playing section it's their job to match the lead alto hmm. and the lead alto has to be playing in time you know the music can't be like you're soloing like this big expansive beat and swinging and experimenting with somewhat rubato phrases and trusting the rhythm section to keep things steady so when when like and when you're playing section saxophone or any wind instrument, trombone or trumpet, it's, you know, the lead player has to lay it down and it's their job to match that dynamically, phrase wise, note length and everything. So, sure. um, and, and sometimes these big expansive swingy um, rubato type phrasing, it doesn't cut it in section playing. You know, the hmm. section has to have a forward propulsion too. So luckily now the 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 band that the lineup right now are a bunch of group of guys that love being there, and and they study the nice. music, they listen to the recordings, and it's just a great era. I mean, in the twelve years I've been in the band, it hasn't always been that way. Sometimes, you know, it's a fight among sections. And this is brass tracks we're talking about. Oh no, I'm sorry. This is the uh, swing band on on Thursday nights at oh, the okay. Green Mill. Oh, we're back to Green Mill. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so. So th this is interesting. So where do I, did, did, where don't, the don't they do in? a lot of collective improv there? So, so one of the things about really early jazz that's different about later jazz, a lot of the times the drums, like we were talking about, they become that framework, just the boom, boom, and then everyone simultaneously improvises around that. Well, it's, do you guys it, do a lot of it's that? Your, you know, you're what, no, no actually no. Okay, it's, interesting. It's not that, and that reminds me of the, the, the little bit of studying I've done about you know, um, the, the early Basie band there, you know, there weren't, they, they didn't, they didn't work to get, getting together with arrangers, you mm -hmm. know, um, like to me, I'm thinking Fletcher Henderson is the, the, one of the early guys who, who was a master at big band arranging. And before that, it was a bunch of horns. Let's, you know, like they're playing a big dance, dance hall and they're adding more and more horns and we got to be louder. And there were no arrangements, and it was that. It yeah. was coming up, and that contributed to the Basie style, where there were riffs. And there, you know, they one o'clock jump. When, if you're doing that, you have to play really simple stuff, because everyone's all playing at the same time. So if you start to get really harmonically complicated, it'll just sound like kind of, you know, so they're like, they tend to be oh, like, it could be they're a almost mess. pentatonic, a lot of it. It's, but it... And then bluesy pentatonic stuff, and then it, it all starts like to Like one o'clock jump. Be -de 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 um it's yeah a lot of it was simple but it was riff 
Yeah. You know, like some guy would, you can only imagine being there. Some guy would, would, would teach the other section a riff and they'd all jump in. Yeah, man. But, um, it was, but it was still, still chaotic and it wasn't organized. But I think my, my experience is, is Fletcher Henderson would come in and brilliantly orchestrate arrangements for the big bands. Yeah. And when you hear him leading his band, it's just, it's, just, it's so poetic. Right. And danceable at the same time. Steve, we, we have to talk about um, some of your, just, just some of your vintage stuff too. And, and we're going to play. I have to pee though. So I'll be right back. <laughs> so you're going to edit that out? <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's up to Jake. <laughs> Jake's, yeah, for sure. But yeah, so Steve, um, so basically, <clears throat> yeah, the we talked a lot about styles and playing and stuff like that. But one of the things that I've always thought is really cool about you is you've got some like even like collector grade stuff and you always bring it out to play and that's so cool so maybe just can you talk a little bit about the the different drums that you've gathered over the years and just maybe how they sound and why you use them why you choose to bring them bring them out because some of the stuff is like really nice stuff. oh absolutely but um don't forget what i said earlier i don't i don't consider myself a collector and sure. i'm not a gearhead although um maybe i lean towards <laughs> being one um yeah. but my my philosophy is um a wide variety of tools because it, by being a side man, I mean, let's just say it, I'm a side man. My, the amount of leader dates I do are very few. You know, it's very important that I, I capture the genre, the mm -hmm. time period, and I'm supporting the artists that I'm doing it for. And to me, it's very much a service and it's a gener. It has to do with being a giving person. I am giving to the other musicians, I'm supporting them the best way that I can. Um, to the audience, you know, if you're playing for dancers, you know, you give them what they need. Um, whether it's a, a, a strict ballroom gig, which I didn't mention before, but I was Teddy Lee's last drummer before he passed away. Hmm. Um, he, he was like one of the kings of ballroom, of the sweet bands. Okay. And um, yeah, I was his last drummer. around here in the... Oh yeah, he was doing the Willowbrook forever mm. uh, and then the Willowbrook burned down and then he moved over to Glendora House on South Harlem huh. so he would have a weekly I think I've been there before I think I saw Mike Al Albinac you, you know him he, he was playing with uh what yeah some some uh, is it a really big ballroom kind of oh the Willowbrook was very large and the Glendora is pretty big too yeah, the I think yeah I think I've been there before. Cool place. Oh, it was it, <clears throat> musicians loved playing there. They had name bands there back in the day, and um, yeah. it, it, it was a sad thing. Kind of out by Midway a little bit, right? Um, you think um Archer Road um in Willow Brook, yeah, Willow Springs, yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, um, so that was that's playing in the sweet band, and that's that's ballroom. So it's fill your dance card, and yeah, it's um you know you'll do. A two-step, you'll do a swing, you'll do a waltz, maybe a Latin, um, and then... What's a two-step? Like a, a, a two-beat, like a two-beat. So like... Like think like drummers think of it as playing in two, where the okay, bass is sure. on one or three, and you're... Yeah, yeah, sh 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sure. <laughs> And then the next dance set might have a rumba, a waltz, yeah, um, and a swing tune in it. So, but, so I mean, <clears throat> the point I'm trying to get at is it's you're in service to support as, mm. as a side man you know the the audience the dancers the the artists mm. that you're playing for and the gear should should back that up it should be the appropriate gear so so why why do you uh kind of dig the vintage stuff um it, mm. it had to do with um it had to do with when you're a playing lot of old potential music. Potential reasons because it looks a certain way and it sounds a certain way. Too. Oh, the, yeah. you can't you can't um, <clears throat> downplay the look. I mean, it has to do with the pride yeah. of, of of you know loving your instrument and the way you, you present yourself and the yeah. whole the whole visual thing too. Absolutely. So um, so having said that, I'm not a I wouldn't call myself a collector, but I like to have I like to have a bop kit, you know, for when. It's it's I it's probably the set that I play the least. What's your coolest bop kit you got right now? Um, I just have <laughs> one. It's uh, uh it's a broadcaster kit that I got from you guys. It's, oh nice. Uh, and it's black so it's a new with, broadcaster. Yeah, yeah, it's a modern broadcaster. That was our last deal, I think, right? No, I think we've Oops. no. I bought uh the last deal was I got a uh, Cadillac Green. Oh okay. Uh, 120th anniversary progressive jazz set from you, and I got a Craviato. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. 
uh, 22, 13, 16, matching six and a half, but that's a different story. Sure. So, um, <laughs> so to me, it's important to have uh, a big band kit sure, or a sure. couple, you know, like 24, 22 inch uh, sets. Um, you, I have a, so you, you've played like, <clears throat> let, let's just talk about snare drums just to narrow it down a little bit. Sure. So like I find if I'm playing in kind of like a big live room and I want to be really quiet, I actually want my snare drum to be like a little bit less resonant because it, and just kind of a little bit more quiet kind of, and some people will say even like the boxy sound, but so some of the older drums in particular, maybe Slingerland Radio Kings, they're just, they're kind of quiet drums. They're just they're kind of quiet. You, you can get a really good rim shot out of it if you want, but when you kind of do like press rolls on the sides and when you play around, it's just for whatever reason, maybe imperfections in the shell, whatever it is, they're just a little more kind of quiet and subdued. Did, what, what do you think? Do you, do you find that uh, with, uh, with the old drums, maybe that's a, a desirable quality for playing the style of music? Um, it's, I'm actually confused in these things. You'd think I'd have, I'd have <laughs> high, better opinions, but um, when, <laughs> sure. you, when you take one instrument to one room and you think it's, you think it's the bee's knees, right. and then um, you take it to another room and it sounds like, uh, like boxy awfulness. Sure. So it's, um, it, to me, it's just a, uh, it's, it's an ongoing experiment. And do, do you have like a most commonly used snare or do you, um, do you just kind I of have, cycle? <laughs> I have some workhorses. I have, um, I, I got from you uh, uh, a Craviato uh, 12, 14, 20, kind of like a progressive jazz sizes and a five and a half. Mm -hmm. And that's been one of my workhorses. It's maple just, probably, right? It's maple with, with sharp edges. 45. Yeah, that's just the go-to so, snare. <laughs> yeah, it's just such a workhorse. You know, you can do so many things with it. They even, they have, Craviatos have a little bit of that old quality. They're more. They're more alive. I think they're they're a little louder and a little more resonant than the the uh, the old ones. But they they have a they have a little bit of that vintage quality because they have reinforcement hoops, just like the old Slingerlands. They have it's a single ply shell, just like the old Leedies and Slingerlands and Ludwigs. It's made almost exactly the same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's some incredible drums. Some drums out there are really loud, incredibly loud and powerful. Well, like, you know, do you have any me, DWs? They're just like DW floor toms. In not particular. at the moment. No, no, I'm not very, bashing very DW. Powerful. I just don't have any at the moment. Um, it really depends on what yeah. you're doing. Like if you're, if you're only a backbeat kind of guy, sure, yeah. then that might be the appropriate instrument. Titanium snare even you might need. <laughs> yeah, something even more. But yeah. I find that um, I like to me to support the music, I have to have this wide range. You know, I have to be able to you know, to play, you know, whisper quiet, which I, which means I need good articulation and sustain and brightness. And then I need to be able to lean into it too. Um, so, you know, I'm not really an expert. Um, I just, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not. You've so. got some cool stuff. I, I think I really like your Leedy White Room Pearl kit. Yeah, yeah, I've had several of them. I finally found one. Um, usually they're nickel. Yeah. Uh, yeah so, nickel over so brass. Beautiful. But I found, which is even rarer, uh, chrome over brass, and it's American chrome. The thing just, it's just gorgeous. So, oh, it's snare, and, yeah. No, the whole set. Chrome, uh, you mean the hardware is just? All the, all, the hard, all the hardware is chrome over brass. Right, right. You know, the lugs, the hoops, everything. Yeah, yeah. And, they had um, brass hoops back then, which sure. they rarely, very rarely, almost so, all modern hoops are steel. So for that <laughs> instrument, um, you know, it's 24, 13, 16. It's a, it's a goofy hoop-mounted tom mount which right. doesn't choke it it just puts it in the perfect spot I and mean, sure. it's so simple and it, it's it's just perfect you're probably the only guy who actually uses that for a gig and, and it's <laughs> that's, that's it looks awesome. like it looks like new old stock when i got it and sure it, i don't think it had been played which is weird because you have the discussion with horn players sometimes they'll like they'll find they'll say they found the most beautiful instrument like an old trumpet or something sure. and the reason there's a reason why it's still beautiful because it didn't play well so, oh. <laughs> you know, but then there's the, the, the oddity that it just gets put away, you know? Sure. Yeah, it could have been like a gift for somebody that maybe went unused or but something. For, yeah. me that, for, for me, that Leedy Ludwig, it's perfect with, with skin heads on it and because it's, <laughs> the drums aren't perfect, you know? Um, you know the, they're handmade, and it's, it's kind of a challenge finding... You use calf skin sometimes, I think, right? Yes, on, on that, that kit, I just keep skin heads on it. That's another thing we kind of have in common I, I i really like those and uh what about in the 
Well, you probably don't in this weather because it's pretty. It, when it gets really hot and humid, you probably don't. Bother well, I find out. that the bass drum and the toms sound really cool there. You know, oh, so you especially even, if you're playing wow, if you're playing awesome. old music and big band music, it's nice to have the the bass drum and the toms come in underneath. Yeah, and yeah. Not to be, not be doing doing doing. You know, uh, not be just be the boingy bop sounds for those. I find yeah. for the large ensemble, it's good to have power and sustain from the toms. You know, it, you can't rip off the licks as quick, but it's a it's a compromise I'm willing to make. But the snare drum t- is boxy. I mean, I can never make a leady, leady snare drum sound right. I just don't. So you don't you don't necessarily like leady snares too much. I mean, I just can't make mine speak, and I've, sure. I've had probably four or five of them. So the strainers can be a real pain because they you you have to undo it to disengage it you have to actually loosen it and then when you re-engage it you have to tighten it again well a lot of them were designed yeah. to have extended snares too and then um it's it's the it's, broadway uh, ones that we were thinking of um the, the all the ones that i've ever had were designed to have extended snares so yeah and you can put regular snares on it but i mean i i have no the 20s shame. ones are maybe a little little better but it still has that little they, they've got quirks <laughs> yeah i have no shame taking that set out with a different snare drum yeah so yeah, man. Um, I though um, I've been playing the uh, the set I got from you. I got a a, a twenty two thirteen sixteen matching six and a half Craviato, just okay, just maple with forty fives, and yeah, uh, it's it's an amazing instrument. I, I I had it at the Epiphany Center Sunday, and yeah, just the it's just such an amazing instrument. Now, the, Good deal. but <laughs> it's but and I have to say it's a pain to move because it's you, I'm not gonna go at it and drill. Um, Oh. Time mounts into it. I, oh, the, just, I won't do it. The extra snare stand is a pain. Well, I actually put it on a, a floor stand that doubled as a, a symbol stand. Yeah, and yeah, to you me, get a heavy duty to one, me, that's yeah. very awkward. It's just awkward. I, I could drill it for you if you wanted for uh, like a Yamaha. <laughs> no, I won't drill it. So <laughs> it, do, it would reduce the value a little bit. We can do that though. And the other thing is not to not to get too technical. The lug spacing because it doesn't have the uh, tube lugs. It has the the diamond lugs. Diamond lugs. Oh. The, the lug spacing is two and a quarter. So I can't, I can't put Ludwig Atlas lugs that double as tension rods using the oh. pre-existing holes, and I can't use the Indy systems either because I've, I've, I've done that. I, I, I'm just funny. I won't draw. What have you? Uh, the, the thing that uh, grabs to the hoop. You could, you could engineer one of those and then put it to a suspension mount. <laughs> Maybe. You're right. You're right. And if anyone has, there's any always some way to do it. Yeah. yeah. If anyone out there has some suggestions on how I can mount. My 13 above my 22 without drilling. That would You're be probably cool. doing it the best way possible. <laughs> yeah, with the yeah. Does it have a suspension mount on it then? Um, I just use a yeah. snare basket. That, that's what I would use. It's pretty simple. Yeah. Um, the other thing that uh, an instrument that I got um, a friend of mine is in Lakeville, Indiana, and Indiana was uh, a big a big Camco area. Hmm. Um, there was a teacher there. I'll, I can't remember his name. Um, that would buy camp. He was a Campco endorser. I'll think of his Wolf, name in a minute. Wolf, or wait, uh, yeah, what? Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Uh, the the drums are stamped on the inside. Sometimes he would stamp them. So he was a he, lead. he put different lugs on them, but they would be Campco shells. Oh, uh, not mine. Mine are are just straight up Campco. Um, yeah, Oakland, it Wolf, Oakland tuxedo. Wolf. Um, I I. I'll think of his name and I'll write it in the chat box underneath. Um, I know who you're talking about though, because yeah, I've I've but run there's, into those. There's a, a a Campco endorser that would <clears throat> he would buy sets for his students. Yeah. And so there's quite a few sets, and he hooked me up with a couple. I mean, and they're progressive jazz sizes, but they're so versatile. Right. That oh, those are a couple of my go-to sets. It's Campcos are the. The, 20, 12, yeah. 14 matching five and a half. Right, don't have trouble getting those snares to sound good, right? Those. <laughs> um, one, it's funny. One of them, <laughs> the blue sparkle one, is a gem. Okay. <laughs> like the other you one. can play, you can do anything with the thing. It's a real workhorse. And sure. then I'm wrestling with the white marine pro one. It's just uh, <laughs> so I just I don't know if it's the size of the of the of the hoops. You know how high they are. I don't even know what it is, but. Um, yeah, it, it's part of the challenge. It's part of the pro- part of the progress. Yeah, Camcos, Camcos are amazing. So yeah, yeah I, I, those, those are sets that I'll never get rid of, just because they're so versatile and they sound so good, and they're easy to set up and they're easy to play. Yeah, and it's just, and you're happy when you're playing them. And if you think about what instruments do you think you do, I think I sound the best on. I probably play the best on my Camcos. You know, it's just yeah. 
Yeah, they've they've got kind of a cool bearing edge, white paint on the inside. And then yeah, it's not it's like they have reinforcement hoops, pretty thin shell. And it's not a it's it's actually a kind of pretty rounded bearing edge. It's not really sharp. I don't think they're quite there might be thirties or something like that. Like they're sharp they're less sharp than Rogers. Rogers Rogers had a graduated edge though. Yeah, I'm and not I think, uh, I think that's a new frontier too. for me, Rogers. I haven't really dabbled much in Rogers, but I should Rogers were ahead of their time. They're, I will say that one of my favorite like buddy sounds one playing. of my favorite buddy sounds is when he was playing Rogers. Yeah, yeah. They they were way ahead of their time. The hardware too, the Swivomatic hardware. I mean, can you believe that stuff? It's I mean, that's like Oh, that's the other thing this guy very, did. Very, very functional. That's, <laughs> Swivomatic. That's the other thing this guy did. He um all you could order a Campco set with no no rail mount or anything and he would order them like that and then put a Rogers Swivomatic on it. But just like Ringo yeah. did on his Ludwig set early in the day, right? Cuz sure. it, it was just the coolest mount of the time. We have a camp yeah, some of the Campcos, the early ones, they Yeah, Frank Wolf is who you're talking about, I think. Oh, uh, and it's someone else. Norby um, I don't know. I'll think of it. I'll think Maybe, of it. I'll yeah, write it in the chat box. Cause I'm, I might, I, the, there was like, it was from Indiana and then there was like Camco shells that will have their Japanese imported lugs on them. Yeah. That's someone else. This, this, oh, guy, maybe was, this okay. guy was just straight up, but yeah, the, and, and it is actually a Camco thing though. Yeah. And that the Camco does that a lot. We, we have a kid in here right now, actually, that I think is an early Camco where the floor Tom leg mounts, they're not, uh, the ones you'd think they would be. Okay. They're premier <laughs> for some reason. They're premier, um, really weird ones. Uh, you know, the, the memory or what do they call it? Push button, premier push button. Really? On a Camco from the sixties. Very strange. And then it has, I think WFL dis- disappearing spurs. And, uh, it's actually an 18, 12, 14 black diamond pearl we have. It's a, that's a pretty cool one. So those things are impossible to get. I'll probably never get rid of them. I mean, it's yeah. just, uh, you never you don't see camp goes too often. So, um, those are a couple of go-tos. Um, I, I usually stick with American drums, <clears throat> nothing against any imports or anything. Although I dabble with sonar sure. too. Um, I um, sold you one. Yeah. You, yeah you I still a... have that. And I, I love playing it. It's a, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like a modern vintage this series, right? What, what was the finish on yours? It's white Marine Pearl. It's 22, okay. 13, 16 and a matching six and a half. Didn't you get a, uh, uh, mi- uh, Gretsch mist kit once? Um, yeah, I, I got a, um, yeah, I've copper I've, mist, copper mist. I flipped that for something else. Oh, you know, never, yeah, <laughs> that was a cool kit though, right? Which is <laughs> by the way, I can't, I can't tell you how cool it is to have this <laughs> shop in town. <laughs> Thanks, I, man. We're happy to be here. <laughs> no, like where I don't have to, um, it's not <laughs> online sales. It's not shipping. I can yeah. come in here and you actually I actually pick up, like, feel how much it weighs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like the, uh, I was in the other, the other month and I came in and I, um, I ended up leaving with, um, I've been playing this set too. This is a, uh, a t- 125th anniversary Gretsch, um, Cadillac green. Yeah. Set. Yeah. yeah so, that's... and that's progressive jazz sizes. It's that's beautiful. 2012, 14 and a five and a half. Maybe it's a five. You brought it to the green mill? I've been, I, you know, it's, I have brought it there. I, I miss not having the big drum there. The fit there, like but, color scheme, um, probably. <laughs> you know what? It's, we make a big deal out of that. Nobody notices that. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Which, which I, which, which reminds me, nobody notices, you know, some people uh, like the drum set, like, you know, I mean, I'm out of circulation. You see with me with my ring here, this is the personal sure. side. I guess we could take a break from the gear, but, um, <laughs> sure. um, in, in hindsight, if you, if you're, um, you know, if you wanna, um, if you wanna um, get noticed by the girls, it hasn't been drums. You know who are who are really doing well are the swing dancers. Yeah, yeah, because it's social dancing. A lot of them come unspoken for, and it's there's nothing creepy about, you know, sure. changing around couples. <laughs> and you know, where where do you think your odds are better? It's behind the drum set, you know, if you're in sure. circulation or if you're on the dance floor. <laughs> I mean, so it's just a, the, it's just an observation accordion. I wanted to share with our accordion audience. is the, that's the most, yeah, the most, yeah. Oh, cause you're, if out you're there an with accordion player. No woman can resist <laughs> good, good accordion. <laughs> Drum, drums on the other hand. Yeah. They're so loud. Yeah. <laughs> so you might, you know, pu- push away. Yeah. I, I, I suppose my drumming, I met, I did meet my wife in college for music. 
Is is your wife a musician? I can't remember. Uh, she played in um, like a Chicago um, orchestra. She played violin in high oh, school. Nice. My wife's flute, yeah, flute player. So. And uh, but she's not playing now, so which is okay. Yeah. It keeps keeps things a little bit simple to have. You don't you don't have too sure. much neurotic competing people. <laughs> yeah. Um, neurotic sure. interests at home. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, yeah, man. Any other any other topics you want to go into? We can. We could go, you know. Um, just you know, just what the you're doing um, these days. Maybe like a, a shout out for a couple big gigs coming up. I don't know. Um, I've just got my studies and I fill in. You know, it's freelance. It's freelance. Chicago is sure. a great place. You know, it, with if you don't have a, you know, salaried gig like you know with the symphony opera or you're doing the the theaters. Yeah. Um, it's Chicago is a, a great place place for freelance. It's just um, <laughs> and um and and it's an easy place for drums too. Um, I've never had a social media presence whatsoever because um, it's no secret that I'm a public school teacher as well. Sure. And I made up my mind. I was like, well, I'm not going to do anything social media. I, I just I want to keep my school professional life separate from sure, my sure. personal and I'm kind of life. the same way. I don't, I don't even have my own Instagram account. And I no, go in the shops one, but I don't even have my own. Yeah, no regrets there. So um, <laughs> It makes but, your life simpler. But as a drummer, it's, you know, if, 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 you, if you go in with this... Uh, if this concept where it's not so much you're not a leader and you're not the star and you're it's not you're not always showing your individual individualism a lot of times it's support you're supporting your players um, you're, you're you're making them sound good um, sure you're supporting the event and if you do the, these things in this this town um, the the drummers do well you know um, yeah and um the other thing I wanted to talk about is how um, you know, this is a personal thing, and I don't know if it's appropriate for this format, but, you know, as a young kid, my parents were divorced, and having drums <laughs> sure. has grounded me in a way that it's given me focus. Yeah, right you on, know, man. The, the music studies, and, you know, everybody who plays knows they're a lifelong learner. It's just, there's always a new frontier. There's always a new group. There's a, a new style. There's new repertoire. There's new independence there's you know the actual technical aspects of playing the instrument always a new frontier and um and the, f the fact that you're able to meet so many cool people and you'll you'll figure out right away who are the people that are supporting you and who are the people you want to be friends with and sure uh, the relationships are just priceless you know it's um i mean i i use my daughter as an example too she she was a collegian and a high school athlete and she also played in band too she played clarinet and piano and jazz band clarinet mm -hmm. and concert band and her her the friends she's still in touch with were the people in band, not so much the collegiate sports. So sure, um, there's just there's something. Yeah, music is an in, a really incredible activity that yeah, that it's very very a very good thing to spend your time doing, whether you're a professional or an amateur or a beginner or yeah, the camaraderie yeah. and the <clears throat> um, the team the teamwork that it takes. Yeah, yeah. It, and it's relationships that last, and some a lot of the bands. Like I've been, um, I was in, um, I was in a wedding band, a really hard hitting wedding band that was doing, I'm no joke, 160, 170 dates a year for decades. Yeah, uh, it was a band led by um, Ralph Wilder, and okay. he retired, and then he passed away just recently. Oh. but I learned a lot from that guy, and but. I was seeing that guy two, three, or four times every weekend. Sure. <laughs> and sometimes during the week, we would do um, Urban Gateway shows around the around the schools. We would do like school enrichment shows, and hmm. the the guys and he and um, I would see him. It almost becomes a second family. You know, it's like hmm. then there'd be band parties, and we we would hang out together even in our free time. We'd share meals, countless meals together at work and stuff like that. Um, and right this, this, these are relationships that last forever. I mean, well, they did in this case. I mean, no joke, three decades I was playing with his group. Maxwell Street, uh, it's a klezmer band. It's a, like a Yiddish folk band. Um, nice. Playing with them. I've known those people since 1989 and still work with that group. Nice. <laughs> um, Tom Fox's band, I've been with his group for like over 20 years. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that's the Wednesday big band. The Gressy group um, <clears throat> for a long time. And then sometimes the gigs end, and that's okay. Oh, and the Outcast has got to be one of my favorite too. There's this group I'm playing with, the Outcast. That's okay. the band that we play at the Epiphany Center. I've been with them maybe I think about 15 years. What genre would that be? You know, it's it's dance music. It's right down the middle. There's not a stinker in the book. Oh, it's it, like swing. It's swing, but it's not 30s, 40s. Um, okay. It's, <laughs> it's um, 
<clears throat> it's um it, it dabbles in a, oh, there's a few charts there but everything's danceable but it's a lot of ella it's louis jordan hmm. it's all the rat packs you know the dean martin so that, the, the that Frank. venue is like a dance the there's a place to to dance well yeah we <laughs> have uh we have the first monday of every month at um the glendora house and the last monday of every month at uh a place right. in lockport called um the roxy awesome yeah and, That's and great. but it's the same thing. I mean, the, I I'm a newcomer to the band. Those guys went to Maris High School together. They're all my age. I'm 58. Sure. Uh, they've they've been playing since high school. They're like they're all playing in concert band. They're like, hey, let's form a band. They're all horn players. Okay. Well, what kind of music do <laughs> horns play? Well, they play jazz, right? Yeah. Well, okay. Let's let's form a big band. And then they started buying arrangements. Nice. And <laughs> um and they've got a great book. And, and a great group of guys. And the, the, the strength of that group is the ensemble. It's not so much, you know, like certain big bands in town or groups are like, wow, you've got Roger Ingram on trump, trumpet. You've got um, Russ Phillips on trombone. There's like individual strengths mm -hmm. and amazing, amazing virtuosity. The Doesn't strength Roger play with uh, Pete Miller's? Oh, he plays with. Uh, he was there Pete yesterday. El Pete Elman. Pete, Pete Elman. Pete Elman. Yeah, that's, Rogers. That's Rogers I, all over yeah, town. Yeah, I saw him yesterday. <laughs> yeah. And he he's on like every Harry Connick Jr.'s record that's, too. Yeah, small world. It's a small musical he, world. He's, yeah. he, his lead playing is just amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm just using them Pete as an Elman. Example. Why do I keep saying Pete Miller? Pete Miller's a restaurant. That's a restaurant with a jam session. In it, well, think, maybe right? you're thinking Steve Miller. I don't even know what I'm thinking. Yeah, the guitar <laughs> Pete player. Elman's big guy. Yeah, yeah. That, that's another cool Chicago area. You, so, have you ever played with them before? I think you said you um, have. Before, Pete Elman. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful group. And, you know, yeah. the other thing is for a lot of the bands, um, they share musicians. <laughs> Shout out for them, too. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they share musicians. So, I mean, I know yeah, a lot yeah. of musicians in that band. That's and the community. And it is. Yeah, it's not like, you know, people it's, it's are making very millions of bucks. Oh, in, in the gigs, big band, they yeah. They love it so much. Yeah. <laughs> It's a it's such a great thing. Uh, there's a place called the Venue in Aurora. Have you have you been there before? That's where the Elman Band plays. Yep, that's where I was last okay. night. Yeah, beautiful room for a big band. Sure. Uh, they have uh, it's it's kind of like this. It's like a warehouse almost, but they have like sound dampening stuff in the ceiling, so it's like a big space with nice sound, but not too overbearing. <laughs> so yeah, the community is very supportive. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, awesome, um, I'm yeah, I'm um, and you're, that's, you're, go gonna, you're gonna play a little bit, so yeah, well, for for everyone listening and watching, yeah, uh, we're gonna play a little bit. He's just gonna show you some of the feels and stuff he's been talking about, but yeah, I think that's that's about it. So nice, <laughs> nice hanging with you, Steve. Right. Well, okay. Until the next segment, Steve. Thanks so much for inviting me. I hope yeah. I'm able to share something. You know, I'm a um, I'm a drummer journeyman, and um, you know, am I hate playing super high profile? No, but that's okay with me. You know, uh, I I just always knew as a kid that I. I had to be in the middle of music making, and I can't think of a better way to do it than playing the drums. So Yeah, man, right on. <laughs> thanks again for having me. Sure thing, Steve. <laughs> All right. okay. Hi, everybody. Steve Hawk here. I'm so thrilled to be able to share with you some of the things I've picked up playing in some of the older styles. Um, these, to me, they're important parts of the drumming lineage that I would have never had any clue about until I started playing in some of these groups. Um, we're going to start with some hot jazz from the 20s. Uh, let's think of the tune Dinah. So um, I'm thinking I'm going to take my foot off the hi-hat, or if I know I'm only playing that genre, that period of 20s, I won't even bring a hi-hat. But for now, I'm just going to take my foot off to resist the temptation. Um, so I'm thinking the tune Dinah. A lot of the drummers um, were real strong on the bass drum then. We're coming from a marching tradition. Um, but it's also kind of a classical tradition where it's not always drummer-led. It's um, very often banjo-led. So, um, so, and a lot of times it's very simple.
So, um, so that is just some of the vocabulary you need to play that. You know, the bass drum is very steady. Um, the hats, you manipulate them with one hand and you play it with the other. Um, you know, hopefully you find a symbol that you like. This one I found in the, over on the rack here at Steve Maxwell and it sounds just gorgeous. Okay, so um, that's a little bit about the 20 styles. Um, sometimes it's, um, you, you, you just play so simple, you'll hear them do this, just play on the wood block. And then um, sometimes you'll hear them, if it's a different tempo, you'll hear them play um, more like rudiments on the wood block. Um, so that's just some of the vocabulary that you want to use when you're playing that older style. Um, I'm just going to jump right ahead into like the mid 30s. Like the recordings I've heard of um, the Artie Shaw band or even Buddy Rich with, um, with the Artie Shaw and the, uh, the, uh, the um, Gene Krupa band, the, uh, would, um, he was playing with Benny Goodman. Um, uh, he's riding a lot on the hats and they always sound real washy to me and it wasn't always the pattern. A lot of times they would improvise patterns. So, um, one, but one of the things that I have found and it was different from most of our, our studies where we're playing the hi-hat on two and four, if we're playing a bebop style, where even the, the ride cymbal pattern is axing two and four, a lot of times when I'm hearing this early music, it's very much of an emphasis on one and three and a tight sound on two and four. And the bass player would be like a two feel where they're playing on one and three. Um, okay. Um, and then a trick that, that a lot of times were, they were very visual. I mean, if you look at Gene Krupa, he always had this, he was visually exciting and they would play patterns where, and this is something I've been experimenting with, if you hold the stick so that your grip is aligned, like I, don't, I guess I could say perpendicular with uh, the plates of the cymbal, it, mean, it means if you, if you make a mistake, you, the stick won't go flying, but you can actually play patterns like. And if you hold it, yeah, if your fingers are perpendicular to the plates, then you find that, that whatever angles you're doing, it doesn't seem to send the stick flying. But that's the big thing there where um, the emphasis on one and three, and sometimes real tight, sometimes you'll just hear them go. And unlike bebop, you know, I mean, everyone's going to tell you in the bebop gig, hey, lighten up on the bass drum, dude, too heavy on the bass drum. Well, my understanding is a lot of the band leaders encouraged the drummers to be heavy four on the floor for the early swing music. For one, the bass players were not amplified. And the other thing is some of them, you know, that weren't very strong and they couldn't carry the band. So you hear the, when you hear early Gene Krupa, 
playing, especially when he's playing with Benny Goodman in the quartet, where it's just Teddy Wilson on piano, uh, Lionel Hampton on vibe, Benny Goodman on clarinet, and Gene Krupa playing drums. There was no bass player other than Teddy's left hand on the piano, so you'll hear him play some pretty heavy um, bass drum. So, you know, bass drum on all four is part of our lineage. So, you know, later on, when, when you're learning the bebop styles, you, you know, if you are playing four on the floor, and um, Mel Lewis will tell you that, hey, four on the floor is a good thing. It just kind of grounds the band. Not only does it ground your time, but it grounds the band too. But you just have to be more sensitive as you're playing later styles. And you don't want to be the thumper back there and getting in everybody's way. So, um, you know, like, I, I would assume most of us are familiar with music from, you know, the late 40s on when drummers like, um, drummers like um, Max Roach was on the scene, Kenny Clark, Art Blakey, they, um, they were playing um, where the, the symbol, the beat Kate went from the hi-hat. Actually, I'm not supposed to talk and um, drum at the same time. Um, there's actually, I've heard some examples of 30s drummers taking like a hand cymbal, like a marching cymbal, like an old K. Constantinople, and actually riding on it. And then but they would only do it for maybe eight bars or a chorus or something. It wouldn't be the whole tune. So that's just, um, I just wanted to share with everybody some of the things that I've picked up from playing in these early music bands. And it's part of our drumming lineage that I had never learned until I was playing with these groups. So I hope you enjoyed it. And feel free to comment below on things, on any comments or any uh, techniques or vocabulary. Uh, drumming vocabulary that you think would be relevant. All right, thanks everybody. We'll see you all real soon.